Hello everybody and uh, welcome back to Engineering Tomorrow's Thermodynamics video series. Um, today, uh, before I get started on the zeroth law of thermodynamics, I actually wanted to describe something that I was talking about in the previous video. So uh, in the previous video I said that we're mainly going to be focusing on changes in energy. And I just wanted to define this change in energy. So essentially uh, for a closed system, um, I'll talk about closed and open systems later, but this is just the simplest form. Uh, the change in energy is the result of the summation of the changes in energy. So what does that mean? So let's say there's a change in internal energy. Okay. And uh, so the summation of that plus the summation of kinetic energy changes and the summation of uh, potential energy changes. So if you add all those up, what that's going to give you is the total energy. And I just wanted to make that point uh evident um i know it wasn't very clear in the previous video but i hope i hope this makes sense to you i'm just saying that there's a linear relationship between the changes in energy and the total energy okay so uh, yeah that's that's what i wanted to address really quick before we got started so uh next i just wanted to introduce the zeroth law let me save it up here um, don't don't worry about this section right here um so the zeroth law so if you're thinking about you know, thing, so let's say you grab on to the table. Right? The table will be at room temperature. You don't really uh, think it's that hot. Um, and then compare that to touching a stove. So, you know, the stove is going to be really, really hot. But how do you quantify the level of hotness? You know, to me, uh, hot could be one thing. And maybe that relates to like 20 or, you know, 100 degrees uh, Celsius. And to somebody else, it's 99 degrees Celsius. You know, there's like a, there's a subtlety there. Uh, there's a difference. And, you know, how do you quantify how hot something is? Um, not, not, you know, like in a relative term, like, oh, that's hot or that's, that's cold. Um, and it turns out that uh, material properties actually allow us to predict uh, the level of hotness of something um, in a more effective manner. You know, it's something that'll be used. It can be used in an analysis. Okay, and uh, this, the simplest scenario I can explain is a thermometer. So if you think about a, you know, look, a common, not common, I don't think mercury thermometers are used anymore, but if you look, think about a mercury thermometer, if you stick it into a hot cup of water, the, uh, the property of mercury is going to be, uh, fluid is going to be expanding inside the thermometer. And what you can do is you can relate that change in expansion to a change in energy. So that, that's how you, you know, you can, the, the scale on the thermometer allows you to determine the temperature and that, that scale was created for the properties of mercury. So um, the reason you use mercury and you don't use, you know, water inside the container is because mercury uh, reacts a lot faster, or tends to go to thermal equilibrium. So that, that's the important thing to grasp here. It tends to go to thermal equilibrium faster than what water would be doing. You know, it would take a lot more time. So, again, thermal equilibrium is what allows us to uh, actually take this measurement. So, mercury will go to thermal equilibrium with uh, the, the, what you're measuring the temperature of, um, and then that'll allow us to determine the temperature of uh, what's inside. So, this, this all goes back to the zeroth law of uh, thermodynamics. So, um, the zeroth law of thermo uh, actually states that if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with a third body, they are also in equilibrium to themselves. Okay, so what does that mean? So say you have a container right here that's at a certain temperature that's high, and then you have another section here that has a temperature that's low. Okay, and you combine these. Okay, and you get a T. Okay, so if this section, sorry, you don't combine these. Let me just say that they're together. Okay, so there's heat transfer, you know, going from the hotter section to the colder section, and eventually you'll get a T that is average. Okay, so this would be said to be in thermal equilibrium. So if you wanted to determine the temperature of this, you would stick a thermometer here in the middle, and you would have a temperature from the thermometer. So what this is saying is, if the thermometer is in thermal equilibrium with this one, and it's also in thermal equilibrium with this one, 
the two sections are in thermal equilibrium with themselves. And this is the basis for, you know, allowing us to take temperature measurements. Because um, you could think of these two containers as uh, uh, different sections of air, right? Uh, the sections of air will be at th in thermal equilibrium at a certain location. And you put your thermometer there, and it's also in thermal equilibrium with the thermometer, and you can read the temperature as well. And this can also be set to say uh, if two, uh, two sections, I guess, are in thermal equilibrium with themselves. Um, sorry, just a second. Yeah, they're in thermal equilibrium with themselves, then you can also determine the, th the temperature using a thermometer. Okay, so that's, that's just a simplified form. And the reason there's a zeroth law is because the other laws of thermodynamics do not um, allow for this explanation. So they actually created this law after some of the other laws. Um, okay, good. So next, uh, what I wanted to talk about is the temperature scales. So temperature is commonly written as uh, in degrees Celsius, or degrees Fahrenheit, or Kelvin, or Rankine. Okay, and actually Celsius is related to Kelvin, and Fahrenheit is related to uh, Rankine. So, what is a degree Celsius? So, a degree Celsius was created a long time ago. It's part of the SI unit, and it basically, you know, it's it was created on a scale that from zero to one hundred C. Um, this is the freezing point of water. Okay, and that is the uh, evaporation point of that H2O. Okay, and then uh, I'm not entirely sure how, how the Fahrenheit one was created, but it's it's similar. There's, there's two reference points um, just just for so that you can I guess determine well, the difference between them if you think about Fahrenheit. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the uh, freezing point, and 212 degrees Fahrenheit is your boiling point. So that's just to give you an idea of how the two scales are actually different. So between Celsius and uh, Kelvin, so before I explain what that is, um, Kelvin and Rankine are actually two uh, thermodynamic temperature scales. So what does that mean? What that means is that they are independent of uh, other properties of the system. So it gives you an absolute scale that you can use uh, in temperature measurements. So the relationship between degrees Celsius and Kelvin is that uh, a deg uh, Kelvin, so Kelvin is not in degrees. Kelvin is a degree Celsius plus 273.15 Kelvin. Okay, And the relationship between Fahrenheit and Rankin so Rankine is equal to degrees Fahrenheit, whatever temperature you have in degrees Fahrenheit, plus 459.67 Rankine. Okay, and um, the relationship between these two scales can be boiled down to a relationship between the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and uh, degrees Celsius. So a degree Celsius is 9 over 5 or degree Fahrenheit is 9 over 5 degrees Celsius um, plus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and basically if you wanted to know what Kelvin was, you could just, you know, move 273 over here, plug that in for degrees Celsius, find Fahrenheit, and once you have Fahrenheit, you can find Rankin, you can find the relationship between each other. And additionally, I just wanted to say that uh, oftentimes, it ch or always a change in Kelvin is going to be equal to a change in Celsius and a change in uh, Fahrenheit is going to be equal to a change in Rankine. So sometimes it is important to use absolute variables or absolute temperatures Kelvin um, when you're doing an analysis but uh, a lot of times there's changes in temperature like we were saying with the energy at the beginning uh, so you could just use the change in degrees Celsius. So just to be to be sure, I always, so I always use absolute. Okay, and the reason I do this is just for a sanity check. I don't, I don't want to run into any issues where I use the you know, the degrees Celsius, the degrees Fahrenheit, and it messes up my analysis. And I recommend that you do this as well. 
it doesn't take a lot to do. Um, and it's, it's just good engineering practice to do that. Uh, also, last but not least, I just wanted to iterate that I am going to be using primarily the uh, system and the rationale of, uh, you know, of units. Um, I'm, you know, in, in America, there's a lot of use of, you know, ranking, Fahrenheit, uh, pounds, things like that. But I think just for simplicity, uh, the SI system is a lot easier to understand. Um, and that's the one that we're going to be using over here. Okay, so uh, thanks for watching the video, and I'll see you at the next one.